we have had not five, not 10, but 15 virtual chapels, which we've called Chapel Live since we've been quarantined in mid-March. 15 weeks we've been together and we have done 15 virtual chapels. We've averaged about 80 people each week. And today will be our final Chapel Live until we return for the fall semester. Many heartfelt thanks to those who I affectionately call the Chapel Live tech team. That would be Sue Yavor, Taylor Gray, and Heather Norsini. Now, I am not overstating this. Without their skillfulness and commitment, we would not have been able to do Chapel Live each week. So many thanks, Sue, Taylor, and Heather. I'm also grateful and thankful for President Matthew's weekly commitment to Chapel Live. Looking back over the 15 weeks, he's done a bit of everything. He led worship, read scripture, offered a message, and prayers, and his weekly comments have been welcomed. And also, too, for many of you, you know that um, in our chat room at the end of the service, we ask for prayer requests and praises. I want to thank my prayer partners during these 15 weeks, President Matthews and Heather Norsini, as we have collectively prayed for the people and the requests that have been listed. I am also grateful to be partnering with President Matthews this morning on the chapel message. Yes, friends, one scripture passage, one chapel message shared by two people. You will then be asked to grade us on how we did with a quick survey as you exit the Zoom webinar this morning. No, I'm only kidding, that's not true. That is not true, but I thought I would say it anyway. Uh, and lastly, a warm welcome this morning to Andrew Pontel and our new director of the University Choir and Turning Point, and to Thank his you. wife, Una Patelli, for leading us this morning in, in musical worship. So we welcome Andrew and Guna, um, and we're grateful that you are here and part of our community. As the Apostle Paul reminds us, friends, from Colossians 3, 12 to 14, as God's own, let us clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, and patience, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, and crown all these things with love, which binds everything together, in perfect harmony. President Matthews. Thank you, Papa Monica, and it's good to see everyone, and thank you for being a part of this significant chapel. After this, uh, we have a, a short summer break, and then we will resume in the fall. Uh, we're excited about the fall opening. We're preparing campus protocols, and it's such a weird and interesting time when we are called to live by faith in every generation, but each generation has its own issues to deal with that shapes opportunities, problem solving, our dependency on one another. And I'm so grateful for Eastern and for our commitment to be together. And so as we do this today and, and worship the living God, the present God, the loving and forgiving and healing God, the God of justice, the God of mercy, the God of goodness, we come together as a community in faith so thank you for being here. I also want to say, since I'm a parent, that with this delicate balance of moving to green in Pennsylvania and in our county, there can be a euphoric response of freedom that says, now I can do whatever I want again uh, in our habits of getting out and playing and celebrating and being with friends. All I can say is, please be wise if you've been following you know, in the South, uh, it's been really spiking again, and the demographic has been between 20 and 30 year olds. So mm -hmm. I'm not too parental, but we are called to be wise, and how do we manage risk? And may the Lord protect and bless all of us as we do so. It's so great to have Andrew and Gunnar here, and ask your blessing on them, Lord, and as they lead us to celebrate and worship the living God. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Matthews. We thank you, Lord, for our student musicians, Angels of Harmony, our praise group that have led us this morning and opened up the space to praise your name. We praise your holy name, God. We ask you to give us 
the strength to worship you from our homes this morning. We want to acknowledge, Lord, that we are temples of your Holy Spirit. We ask you to help us find that space inside ourselves this morning to become the temple of the Holy Spirit, to become church to each other. Most of us have never met. We thank you, Lord, that we've had the courage to join this morning to meet in this way. We praise you, Lord. We give you thanks, Lord. We think of everyone that's filled us over this time. I thank you, Lord, for everyone that's filled me with the praises of your holy name. And we sing, uh, we'll lead you in two English refrains here of Lord, prepare me. And then we'll do one that's written in Spanish there. And then we'll do two more English. So please um, lift your voices, lift your hands. Christ our Savior, as we sing together, Lord, prepare me. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, poor and holy, tried and true. Church. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Let's magnify God's holy name. Pure and holy, tried and true. Let us lift up holy hands and magnify his name and worship him. Praise you, Jesus, and we bless you. We reflect today in music on our mission as a university. No matter where we are in that, in that mission, whether we're beginning on the journey, whether we've been doing it our whole lives, whether it's our calling, whether it's our cross, we ask you, Lord, to support us. We reflect today on faith, on reason, and on justice. We begin with a reflection, a morning reflection in the light of reason. Well, I woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind, and it was stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Sing a church. Oh, no condemnation. No condemnation. 
no condemnation in my mind when you keep it stayed on Jesus. No condemnation in my mind when you keep it stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus be the captain of my mind. Oh, Jesus the captain of my mind when you keep it. Stayed on Jesus, Jesus the captain of your mind when you keep it. Stayed on Jesus, Jesus the captain of your mind when you keep it. Stayed on Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lead us to freedom, Lord. We're going to walk and we're talking. Walking and talking in my mind, and it was. Stayed on freedom, walking and talking in my mind when it was. Stayed on freedom, walking and talking in my mind when it was. Stayed on freedom, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus, for the ability to meet together today through technology. Thank you, Jesus, for the, the gift of instruments. Help us to be an instrument of your peace. We pray now as we reflect on justice. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We read that in the book of James, chapter one, verses two to four. We remember, Lord, that as Paul writes to the Corinthians, love always protects, love always trusts, always hopes, love always perseveres. He writes in chapter 13, verse 7. So, Lord, we stand before you today. We rejoice, as Paul writes to the Romans, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God at this dark moment. Not only so, but we also rejoice, we rejoice, Lord, in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Fill us, Lord, with hope for justice. I keep your eyes on the prize, know the sun will soon arise. In the darkness, lift your eyes, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. In the darkness, lift your eyes, hold on, hold on. Are you tired of the fight? Are you weary to invite? Keep on walking in the light. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Keep on walking in the light. Hold on. You remember? Watch him die there in shame. We are called to do the same. We live it. The children boldly bear his name. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Children boldly bear God's name. Hold on. 
darkness lift your eyes. Keep on walking in the to school strong in faith. sees the invisible, expects the incredible, receives the impossible, faith that can conquer any. I can uproot my problems. Faith to know God can solve them. Faith to envision my freedom. Faith that can conquer any, any. Faith to reach the unreachable. Faith that stands the invincible. Faith that to remove the unmovable. Faith to beat the unbeatable. Faith that can conquer. Faith to fight the unbeatable. Faith to remove the unmovable. Faith that stands up to the invincible. Faith that can conquer and That sees the invisible faith that expects the incredible 
take that can conquer anything. Thank you, Andrea and Guna. We're going to read now the passage that is the basis of our shared sermon today. It's taken from Matthew 16, verses 13 to 18. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they, some said, John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. When our son Matthew was about to turn eight years old, he wanted to have a special birthday party my wife was scheduled to be at a conference the weekend of Matt's birthday, so I decided to ask Matt what he wanted to do. An eight-year-old excited boy said, Dad, can you take me to Chuck E. Cheese's for a birthday party? I said, most certainly, son, and, and we would take uh, him, his good friend James, who was the same age, and then his younger brother Christopher, who was six years old. And it was a wonderful time. We put the, kid, put the kids in the minivan. We went to Chuck E. Cheese's. And if you've ever been to a Chuck E. Cheese's, it's kind of divided into a lot of games and kids running around. And then another portion is where you would have pizza and have a birthday party. But one of the things about Chuck E. Cheese's that, that I was made aware of is that when you go into the place, you have to have your hand stamped um, so that they know which adult has come with which children. So we did that and, and everything was seemingly going well. There was one time uh, that afternoon that I took Matthew, he said, Dad, this is just the best birthday party I could have ever imagined. So I felt like the best father in the entire world. As we were leaving after a wonderful afternoon, um, we were going through and I had the children, the three, the three boys in front of me and they had their hands scanned so that the ultraviolet mark would be, would be picked up. And then it came to my turn. And unfortunately, because maybe because of some of the hair on my hand and sweat and other things, they could not pick up the ultraviolet scan. And the gentleman at Chuck E. Cheese's was wonderful. He said, sir, this happens at times with some of the adults. We're just gonna ask the oldest child in, the, in your party to just identify you. And so, of course, Matt being the oldest, and it's his birthday, uh, the man turned to Matthew and said, uh, uh, you know, young man, could you please tell me who this person is? And this is what Matt said, verbatim. I've never seen this man before in my life. You could imagine the horror <laughs> of my own shock, but also, too, uh, just the surrounding people there thinking I was absconding with three boys on a late Saturday afternoon. But the, the man said, no, 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 son, son, please, let me just ask the question again. Can you please identify who this man is? There was a pause, a lengthy pause, and Matt said, I have never seen this man before in my life. So a lot of things flashed through my mind. One was, what am I going to tell my wife when I'm arrested at Chuck E. Cheese's? Um, um, it's going to be really a blemish on myself, my chaplaincy at Eastern University. It's a, it gets a lot of messiness. And I also question, why did I become a parent in the first place? I wasn't really sure about that. I was, a lot of things were flashing through. 
So the man said, listen, sir, we're going to have to escort you to a back side room. We're going to have to get, get some identification. You cannot leave with these children because, you know, um, this is something we have to investigate. And of course, I'm giving Matthew the, the stare that was a penetrating stare saying, please tell him. Well, fortunately, you know, after giving them my copy of my license and they made a few phone calls, I don't know who they called. They said, okay, sir, we know that that is your son and children and so forth. And you, you are free to leave. I said, okay, thank you. Now, I don't know if you, for those of you who are parents in the audience, you, you're looking for a teachable moment here. Like um, either I'm going to do something that I'm going to regret for the rest of my life when I leave Chuck E. Cheese is by yelling at Matthew or something, or I'm going to be a teachable moment. So as we're leaving, um, I'm holding Matthew's hand and Matthew's holding his brother's hand and I got James and we're walking towards the minivan and I am just perplexed. It, I'm, I'm, I'm just exasper exacerbated. I, I can't believe what happened. And then Matthew turns to me kind of in the middle of the parking lot and says, dad, wasn't that great? Wasn't that great? What happened? And I'm thinking, were you in the same Chuck E. Cheese's that I was? I was humiliated. I, I felt terrible. He goes, no, 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 no. They knew you were my father. And I said, how would they possibly know, Matthew, that I was your father? He said, look at, look at us. And he began to point to his face. And then he took his finger and pointed to my face, back and forth, forth and back. An eight-year-old was convinced that our identity because it's genetics, right? We look a lot like each other, was, was so compelling that people would have known, regardless of what Matthew said, that I was his father. A pretty interesting story. Of course, we, we grounded Matthew for 11 years after that, but, but he's gotten over it. And he's a wonderful young man of 27 years old now. But the point being, it was interesting to me as I was reflecting upon it, how important identity is how important identity is. We live in a culture that relishes identity. We talk about political, racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, sexual, religious identities, among many others. So the question posed often as who are you is actually one of identity, or perhaps more accurately, one of identities, plural. There's a concept back in the 19, uh, 1989 by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw called intersectionality, and it, it demonstrates that the way we understand people, particularly marginalized people, they have multiple identities, influenced and bound by different aspects of society. So we have race, gender, class, ability, and ethnicity, and so forth. So when you think of a person's identity, you think of multiple identities and perhaps even layers of identities. If we had time, we can go around in this Zoom webinar and ask, how would you describe yourself? What are the many identities each one of us has? As Christians, I'm referring here specifically to one's religious identity, we need to be wary a bit of what I'll call adjectival fatigue. Adjectival fatigue, namely placing too many adjectives between the personal pronoun I and the noun Christian. Now, as we know, adjectives are a part of speech that describes or limits another adjective or noun. So here's an example. I am a Bible-believing, reformed, libertarian, small church, evangelistic Christian. So you see, it took five adjectives here before one gets to the most important word, in my opinion, the noun Christian. Perhaps a better way of identifying might be, I am a Christian who is, and then fill in the adjectives after. Now, please don't get me wrong. Adjectives are very important. But our identities are, are critically important and how and it matters how they are prioritized. So the passage we read this morning, Doc, uh, President Matthews and I, from Matthew's Gospel, to me, is a story about identity. I often remark to students that this passage is like a prism or a lens by which all the other documents of the New Testament can be read through. What we see in this story is Matthew's gospel is two related but different types of identity questions. One involving who people say Jesus is, and the other, who the disciples say Jesus is. Two related but fundamentally different identity questions. This morning, I'm going to just briefly address the first type of question, then President Matthews will grapple with the second and most important type of question. First, a little background. 
This episode in Matthew's gospel is at the end of Jesus's ministry, as he's preparing his disciples for his upcoming suffering, death, and eventual resurrection. It's important to have this type of conversation of identity with those closest to you when you anticipate a significant change in one's life. I sense that Jesus really wants to know if his disciples, those closest to him, those who have been following him for the last three years, understand who he really is. It is a question of real identity. Now, interesting, right before this episode, Jesus scolds the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the uh, Sadducees, for not seeing Jesus, who he really is, the, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Jesus tells them that they pride themselves, this being the Pharisees and the Sadducees, for knowing the obvious. Like, when you see dark clouds in the sky and you say to someone, I guess it will rain, well, that's okay. That's logical. That's something that can be easily comprehended. But Jesus is scolding them for not being able to comprehend the more important issues of his identity. And right after this episode, guess what? Jesus now scolds Peter, the lead apostle, for thinking that Jesus would not have to suffer. Jesus is very stern and says something that I don't know if I would say to anybody. Get behind me, Satan. That's a pretty stern word uh, of, of one who doesn't understand Jesus' identity. And this is all happening in the city of Caesarea Philippi. It's a city of a Roman, it's a Roman occupied city outside of Galilee, some 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. What's interesting about this city is it sits on the border between Israel and the Gentile world. Why is this city important? It's a city filled with statues honoring the Greco-Roman gods and their religions. There are temples and shrines and statues on every street corner. When you walk into Caesarea Philippi, one is reminded of the Roman pantheon. There are many attractive religious choices. There are many religious identities one could choose from in Caesarea Philippi. And this is the backdrop where Jesus asked his questions of identity to those who want to follow him. Which brings us to the major point of Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 18. And this is really what I want to make sure that is clear this morning, especially to those who will be joining us in the fall, the class of 2024. One needs to get Jesus's identity right. Knowing about Jesus is not the same as knowing him personally, knowing him relationally. Nothing else really matters for Jesus, but having that relationship. One of the gifts of Eastern University, uh, one of the gifts of an Eastern University education is that our community assists students, even as we help ourselves, in living into the question of Jesus' identity. It is a serious and consequential question. It is the most important question to grapple with while a student at Eastern University. So before President Matthews offers his portion of this chapel message, one final observation about the first question, who do people say the Son of Man is? You know, Peter is the kind of student in the class that always has his or her hand up, right? He chimes in with a quick response. Jesus, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what people say. They say, are you John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets? And those are good answers, but they're not the right answer. All of those that I just read to you, the names are considered prophets, and prophets are very important in the time of Jesus. Prophets were considered mouthpieces for God to help the people get back in a right covenantal relationship with God. But here's the key. Here's the key. These prophets don't claim to be the Messiah, the anointed one, the one that Israel was yearning for. The buzz on the street, the Gallup poll, is that Jesus was just another prophet stirring up people possibly getting them ready for the coming of the Messiah. But that's woefully inadequate. Jesus corrects the people's misperception when he asks the second and most important question. President Matthews. Thank you, Chaplain Modica. Uh, actually, I'd rather you just go on. I'm really enjoying hearing you preach. I, I kind of don't want to get in the way. Uh, I always find my positions are very safe to say, well, whatever Chaplain Modica says, I kind of agree with him. So thank you, Joe, a real blessing. Uh, the question of, of identity can be influenced by what we do. We can think about our being and our doing. 
sometimes this can be idolatrous or egocentric. For example, when we meet new people, how do we introduce ourselves? Do, do we want to uh, negotiate putting our best foot forward, but is that in a way uh, representing an image maybe rather than who we essentially are? It's difficult. Uh, we can talk about what we do or our interests. I heard a comedian talk about how he wished he had been an astronaut and could walk on the moon because at parties he'd be able to trump anybody else's conversation, you know, and he talked about, oh, I'm CEO of here, and I'm, oh, I'm the, the, and I've traveled here, and he said, I walked on the moon. You know, it kind of is a conversation stopper. And what we do and our interests can certainly inform who we are, but the core of our being, our identity, you know, who are we, who am I, who are you? These are difficult questions and also part of the wonderful curiosity of learning and growing together in a Christian community. Uh, that's what I've loved about Eastern, candidly. I've been here since 1992. Love this place. In the Roman Catholic liturgical year, today celebrates the birth of John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was given the divine task of preparing the way for the Messiah. John the Baptist was thrown into prison and was eventually beheaded. But while he was in prison, John the Baptist sent word to the disciples of Jesus and said, is this the Messiah? Is he the one? And Jesus responded by saying to the disciples, tell John this. And I'm going to read the passage uh, that Jesus actually shares in Matthew 11, 4 through 6. And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Those are powerful words, and they draw on what was a messianic prophecy in Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6. It actually draws on the same language. So Jesus responds in a way that talks about his actions, what he does, and the result of his public ministry. But interestingly, it could have been a shorter question. I mean, John the Baptist had lost everything, and I'm sure he was sitting there in prison wondering, did I do the right thing? My whole life has been invested in this, and I don't see anything. And so Jesus could have simply said, uh, are you the one? And Jesus could have said, tell him, yes. That would have been it. But Jesus, in his concern for relationship with John, wants to further John's faith. And so he says, John, here are the, prof the prophetic mysteries revealed, and that's what I'm doing. Who do you think I am? So he's nurturing faith, even at this very delicate, sacrificial, awful moment in John's life. When we think about this doing and being, what Jesus also demonstrates is that he is essentially one. His being and his doing reflect both aspects. And so there is no conflict between his being and his doing. There's no deceit in his public presentation and who he actually is. He is essentially one as the Son of God. Ontology, okay, that's a word in the name uh, in the field of study in philosophy and metaphysics, particularly dealing with the nature of being. So when Jesus asked the second question, this, this question, who do you say that I am? He is also confronting his disciples with a question about their faith. The word you is in the plural. The disciples had left their vocations, their relationships, and their homes to follow Jesus. For them, it was clear. Peter stated it. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. By answering that way, 
Peter also answers another question. Who are we? And for the disciples, there was simply this answer. We are followers of Jesus, the Messiah. That was it. When Peter said that, Jesus blessed him, and he also blessed all of us, that plural, who have and ever will be part of the church and the body of Christ. The very body of Christ confirms that such a proclamation is the result of a revelation from the Heavenly Father. Jesus goes on to say, you didn't just guess this. You didn't just get human influence on this. This proclamation that you just made is a result of the Father revealing that to you. It demonstrates that there is this kind of mystical, almost weird uh, balance between God's revelation and Peter's proclamation. As we uh, think about that, as we think about how are we joining in this drama with Jesus when he says, who do you say that I am? I'd like to close this as we go into our prayer time, listening to the words of Jesus from Matthew 11, 27 to 30. It captures both the revelation of God and the invitation of God. All things, this is Jesus speaking, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So we understand that the capacity to have grace and faith is a gift from God. It is a, re a revelation. And yet, right after that, Jesus says this, Come to me. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I had a, a friend, he, he passed away about 10 years ago when I was young and a blossoming musician in my studies and performing, he was like a, a superstar for me. He had toured the world as a jazz flute player. He could play anything by ear. He was just an amazing guy. Uh, I knew him when he was a follower of Jesus. I did not know, he was about, I don't know, 25 years older than I was. I didn't know him when he was not a follower of Jesus. And he told me that story. He would perform all over the world, be in the finest venues, and after the concert, when everybody's gone, he would sit down and sadly mourn, thinking, is that it? And then he, he wrestled with, well, there's got to be more. So he got into the occult. He got into witchcraft. He got into various world religions. One of the uh, people in his circle just gave him a Bible. He never opened it. One day, he had gotten so depressed that he was considering taking his life. He went to the back room of his uh, work. He uh, saw the Bible on a shelf. And it was literally that book that was between him and him taking his life. He opened the Bible for the first time. He threw it open. And it opened to Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28. And he read, come to me and I will give you rest. All his life, he was trying to wrestle with this idea 
when, when he performed a beautiful phrase or when he heard a beautiful piece of music, it was so transformative. He said, what is that? I can hear lots of music, but what is that one phrase that is so beautiful, my, my, my heart's aching. And when he saw the words of Jesus, I will give you rest, he thought of the musical phrase and the poignancy of a rest. And he immediately understood the revelation of God, got down on his knees and asked Jesus to come into his life and to allow him to be a follower of Jesus. And that was the rest of his life. Obviously, as a young you know, teenager, that changed my life too. And so I encourage you as we go forward in the summer and as we gather again together in the fall to follow up on this wonderful invitation of Jesus to learn of me. God bless you. God be praised. Amen. Many thanks, <clears throat> many thanks, President Matthews. Well done. We're going to take a time now, as we do in each of our virtual chapels, to open up the chat room so that you could place in those uh, in the chat room any prayer requests or praises. Uh, we really welcome the students that are uh, joining us in the fall and, and their parents and guardians. If you have something we can remember to pray for throughout the summer until your arrival to Eastern, please do that. Uh, the only people that have been praying faithfully through uh, these requests has been myself, President Matthews, and Heather Norsini. So we're going to take a few moments of silence um, to do that, and we'll ask you to please place a prayer request or a praise in the chat room now.
as we bring our uh, Chapel Live um, service to a close, we are grateful for everything that you placed in the chat room. Um, I was going to say this morning's benediction will come from the New York Times Sunday, June 21st, but that's a little bit sacrilegious. But I do want to tell you that one of my Sabbath practices, in addition to worshiping on Sunday, is to try to read through the Sunday New York Times. But here's an interesting article that really stuck with me about um, resiliency. Resiliency. Uh, the, the article is entitled, Build Your Resilience Toolbox. And here's just a quote. Resilient people reappraise a difficult situation and look for meaningful opportunities. I want to thank Eastern University, Chapel Live, those who have been able to attend each and every week or, or as frequently as you can, uh, could, that you've been resilient. There's a sense of resiliency that we shared collectively as we've gone through a very difficult period of time with the quarantine, with the racial injustices and protests, there's a sense that the Lord, in my, in my estimation, is showing us what does it mean to be a resilient community, a resilient Christian community. So I want to thank everyone. I certainly want to thank, again, Heather, Sue, and Taylor uh, for all their expertise and for this morning for Andrew and Guna for leading us in worship and President Matthews. And for those of you that might be in our Zoom webinar who are previous worship leaders and previous speakers during Chapel Live, thank you, thank you, thank you. This was really a, a team effort and a way in which we're inc increasing uh, more tools in our resiliency toolbox as we continue to prepare for the fall semester. So let me leave you with a prayer, a benediction. Lord, we leave from here to bear witness to Christ in faithfulness to the scriptures, in harmony with the church of the ages, and in unity with all of Christ's people. Amen and amen. To the class of 2024, we look forward to seeing you in the fall semester. This is our final chapel live. We'll see you soon. God bless you and God keep you. Bye-bye for now.